Hello, my name is Paul Zwartjes and I'm a geophysicist at Shell. The title of my presentation is Quantitative Analysis of Nine Months of Daily Size Movie Data Acquired at Schoenewijk. In this presentation I'll talk about reservoir monitoring, about how we monitor it with surface seismic, the aerial spreading of steam in the Schoenebeek oil field, and how we use uh, 4D measurements to quantify its vertical growth. I will talk about Schoenebeek, uh, the reason why we need steam flooding, and also the necessity of reservoir surveillance. Steam flooding will change the acoustic impedance of the reservoir. And in order to understand our 4D observations, we need to understand how steam affects velocity and density that make up acoustic impedance. The effects that steam has on the seismic response is quite complex and we try to unravel them with inversion, but unfortunately that did not work. And I'll explain why. After that, actually we try to estimate steam thickness with much simpler methods with basically linear regression, forward modeling, and just plain old 4D time shifts. The Schoenebeek field was discovered in the 1940s. It has been producing for roughly 50 years using the uh, standard beam pumps that you see in the central photograph from the 1960s until the year 1996 when production was stopped. At that time there was still a lot of oil in the ground and that was the reason a redevelopment plan was constructed and that was uh, started in 2011. In this redevelopment plan they used uh, steam flooding and also more modern version of the uh, traditional beam pumps which you see in the picture on the right. So why was steam flooding necessary? The reason was that uh, the Schoenebeck oil is quite viscous, it's kind of like maple syrup and it's waxy, that means it doesn't flow easily and by flooding it with steam we lower the viscosity of the oil and improve its, its ability uh, to flow basically. So how was the steam flood implemented. Well, you can see that in this cartoon that we have on the slide. In the middle, you see this long blue line that indicates a roughly 500 meter long horizontal well. At several locations along this well, uh, we inject steam into the res reservoir. We push steam outwards and then it moves up to form a steam chest. That steam chest expands slowly in an, in an aerial sense and then, or actually fast in an aerial sense and slow in a vertical sense. The steam improves the mobility of the oil, it makes it flow easier and it flows towards the production well, which are basically like two giant sinks flanking the injection well. Now this is a, a cartoonesque explanation and we know in reality uh, that there are a lot of complications. So we will probably not have a symmetric expansion of the steam chest, but there are a lot of um, local variations that could cause it to behave differently, such as variations in porosity, permeability, uh, subseismic faults, anything. And in order to uh, deal with that, we need to do um, monitoring. We need to monitor the proximity of the steam uh, to the production wells, because we do not want steam in the production wells, which would cause a lot of problems for service facilities. This is also the reason that you see on this slide that the production wells are drilled near the base of the reservoir. So to be far away from the steam chest, which is at the top of the reservoir. Now, one easy way to do uh, monitoring is to measure the salinity of the produced water. The formation water, the water that's in the reservoir, is much saltier than the water that we inject into the reservoir. So uh, when we see the salinity of the formation or the produced water drop over time, we know the steam front is near. So that works and it's very simple and effective, but it doesn't tell us how the steam front behaves in between the injection well and the production wells. And for that, we need to have an aerial view. And that's where uh, surface seismic comes in. So we did a trial with uh, a system called Seismovie, which was developed by CDG. And this system consists of um, permanently installed sources and receivers. The sources emit a signal that's reflected uh, at reservoir level, and it's detected by the receivers. One of the major problems we have in, in normally in this kind of experiments, in, in time-lapse experiments, is the repeatability of sources and receivers. In this case, we sidestep that problem completely because the sources and receivers are cemented in place. They do not change. So we don't have positioning repeatability issues and we don't have coupling repeatability issues. And this gives us unprecedented accuracy uh, and we can get 40 time shifts as low as 50 microseconds. On top of that, uh, because the system continuously records and continuously emits source energy, we get daily snapshots of the reservoir. So we can track the steam front in 
uh, unprecedented detail. In 2011, we did a 2D trial uh, to see if the system works as it was advertised to work. It did. We expanded that trial in 2012 to a mini 3D swath, and the parameters uh, of that acquisition are listed here. And what's important to uh, take away from this slide is that we have a, a narrow 3D swath. So it's 160 meters in width and 800 meters in length. Now the total field area is about 30 square kilometers. The area of this particular well pattern is about one square kilometer. So it's nowhere near enough to measure all that we want to know, but it's, an, it's good enough to see uh, steam spreading. So what does this snapshot of the reservoir look like? Well, here's an example. On the left, you see uh, what's called a base survey or base stack. So this is uh, the very first size movie snapshot that we got. Um, you, there's a thin red line uh, running from left to right, which indicates the top of the reservoir. And below that, you see a thin green line. That's the base of the reservoir. And if you look closely on the middle section, you see that in the seismic data, things are changing there. It's much easier to see if you look to the slide on the right, uh, which is the different section. Now, this data is 90 degrees face rotated. And with the polarity convention uh, that we have chosen, this red loop near the top of the reservoir indicates a softening due to steam. So in other words, what we're seeing here is uh, the steam presence in the reservoir. What you also see is that most of these effects happen on the left side of the section. There's also a production well on the right side of the section, but not a lot of steam is going in that direction. To understand the seismic response that we just saw on the previous slide, we need to look at uh, how acoustic impedance changes as a function of steam injection or as a function of heat. We can do that by looking at this cross plot, which has velocity and density. So when we start with the initial conditions of cold water and oil at say 40 degrees temperature, um, we are in the spot where it's labeled number one. We drop the reservoir pressure uh, when we start production and then the velocity slightly increases, which is an effect that's small compared to the other effects. Next, we introduce uh, hot water. So we introduce heat and water. Heat lowers the velocity, but uh, water replacing oil raises the velocity again, but the net effect is still a drop in uh, velocity and a drop in acoustic impedance. The next effect is to go from hot water to steam around 240 degrees. And even a small percentage of steam already has a, a huge effect on the velocity and the acoustic impedance. In the steam test itself, we probably have closer to 90% steam and we have a, a very large reduction in density and a very large uh, reduction in acoustic impedance. Now, all of these effects uh, occur in the reservoir at once stacked on top of each other with the uh, steam test on top and the cold reservoir uh, in, at the base and then a zone of hot fluids in between. And um, all of these effects are mixed in our 4D attribute. And here I have a list of uh, how these various uh, effects um, affect the 4D time shifts as well as the 4D amplitudes. And I suggest you pause the video to see if that makes sense for you. So those were the expectations. What about the observations? On this slide, I've listed for three different time steps uh, the uh, 4D attributes. On the left, the 4D amplitudes. On the right, the 4D time shifts. And just looking at a, with a coarse look at it, you can see that most of the effects occur on the red line in the center, which is the injection well, or actually um, the blue line in the center. And towards the left of that injection well, we have the Western production well, where also a lot of effects are happening, but nothing is really going on on the right-hand side, on the Eastern production well. So when um, we have steam at the top of the reservoir, we expect a large amplitude effects, which is exactly what we see. And we also have uh, accumulating time shifts, which is also what we see. When we have uh, hot fluids in the middle of the reservoir, we don't expect uh, hot amplitudes because there's no steam and we only see time shifts. And this is for instance, what we see uh, in the bottom right figure, where we see growing time shifts towards the Eastern production well, but not yet for the amplitudes. So, this is all very nice, uh, but can we derive more from the data? For instance, how thick is the steam layer? And in order to do that, we uh, try to unravel all these uh, complicating effects with inversion. We wanted to do stochastic inversion for steam thickness and temperature. Unfortunately, that did not work. And I'll explain why with an acoustic inversion example. 
On the left here, you have uh, acoustic inversion applied to a synthetic zero offset. It's actually a relative acoustic imp uh, impedance change. So when we have steam effects, we expect magnitudes in the order of minus 10 plus percent. So here minus 12 percent. On the right, we see the delta AI or the relative acoustic impedance change derived from the field data from the size movie data. And it's about factor 2.5 lower. So why is that? And the reason is um, basically our limited aperture. So we do not record enough energy to faithfully reconstruct the, uh, um, the effects that are going on. I can explain this with this simple cartoon. So we take an impulse and we demigrate it and then we remigrate it. So we de-remigrate it, for instance, with an 800 meter operator, which is not a completely uh, invertible operation. So we have some loss of energy. We can correct this, for instance, with least squares migration, but we haven't done that. Now, in the case of size movie, we also truncate uh, that energy. So basically, and we truncate that because we have only acquired data in an 800 by 600 meter or 800 by 160 meter wide letterbox. And uh, to make matters worse, we don't have an 800 meter operator, but a 300 meter operator. And that nice spike that we had in the beginning is becoming a smeared out pulse. So it has lower, we have lower resolution and we have also uh, lost energy or not faithfully reconstructed that spike. The synthetic with the steam uh, is shown in the bottom. So if we had a perfect example, we would uh, see what we have in the bottom left. But what we actually have is in the middle and the difference is shown on the right. And this is the energy that is lost and this is why inversion is not gonna work. So I can show that here again. Uh, the synthetic example that's shown on the, on the left is now repeated in the middle, but this time where the seismic data was run through this de-remigration exercise. And now the magnitude of the delta AI, the relative acoustic impedance change, is in the same order of what we uh, have measured from the field data. Okay, so inversion is out of the window, that didn't work. So what can we do? Um, well, we go back to the 40 time shifts, although we thought we couldn't unravel all these effects. Let's see what we can get out of it. So can we get steam thickness out of it? And we think we can. So we have the benefit of, of synthetic data and we can, for instance, cross plot steam thickness versus time shifts, which is what we have here. So this cloud of data points is, is a bit scattered because it is not only the effect of steam thickness that you see here, but also, uh, for instance, pressure effects, saturation effects, or varying thickness or temperature gradient in this hot fluid zone. However, we can still do a linear regression, meaning we can draw a line through this cloud of data points and the equation for that line is given in the bottom. This means we have roughly one millisecond or 0.1 millisecond of change for every one meter of steam thickness, or to turn it around every time we see 0.1 millisecond time shift, we can say, okay, steam has grown by a meter. There's a large error bar of it because of this scattering and because of many effects could also uh, cause time shifts. So how does the remigration or how does this narrow aperture that we have in size movie affect our time shifts? What we here have here in the top is four modeled uh, synthetic time shift after three years and then below that the effects of the remigration. And if you uh, pull the line through that or extract the time shifts on a line through that, this is what we see. So we see a roughly 25% drop in time shift, which is quite large. So if we cross plot these data points again, so if we take time shifts versus steam thickness, uh, how does the remigration affect that? So the blue cloud of points is the true time shifts. The red cloud of points are the time shifts with the remigration. And the nice thing about it, it's not a completely different cloud. It's, it has the same orientation. It has roughly the same scattering or same width. So uh, when we do a linear regression, we get also more or less the same equation. Actually, we get almost exactly the same gradient. We get uh, roughly 0.1 milliseconds for every one meter of steam. And this is good because this means that although we have an amplitude deficient, as far as inversion goes, uh, survey, we can still, from time shifts, reasonably, uh, with reasonable confidence, derive uh, steam thickness. And that's what I've done here for three different time steps. You see the time shifts converted to steam thickness. Uh, and what you also see that it's not spread out or the steam thickness growth is not uniform. There's areas where it's larger and areas where it's smaller, especially in the areas where we already have steam, it's smaller, about 0.85 centimeters a day growth. And in the areas where there's no prior steam present, 
we have a fast growth. So we have a, a growth curve or steam growth curve that's, that's rapid in the beginning and then it kind of levels off. And this is confirmed by well data. So what you see here in the bottom right is observations from um, the observation well that was drilled uh, through, the sec through the area between the injector and the Western production well. Now, during the recording of size movie, steam never reached there, but it did so a year after we stopped our experiment. And what we saw then is that steam grew to roughly four meters in a time period of seven months. And that rate of growth is very comparable to what we have measured or derived from our 40 time shifts. Okay, what we've seen is that our steam chest is likely to be locked into preferential paths as we expected. In this case, uh, it's probably due to the uh, closer uh, proximity of the western well to the injection well that's uh, sucking all the steam in that direction. And what we also see is that the steam chest expansion is slower horizontally and faster vertically. So the vertical growth is about three to six times faster than initially expected. Now this scenario of how the steam spreads will probably be different in different well patterns. Um, another conclusion we can draw is that obviously size movie is an excellent 4D tool to monitor our steam flood. With the acquisition setup that we have um, deployed, uh, we were not able to do inversion. It's just too narrow and we didn't get reliable amplitudes. So inversion was not feasible here. But by taking into account those effects, we can do some clever forward modeling and quantitative analysis and at least come up with a, um, an estimate of vertical steam growth. I would like to finish with uh, acknowledgements to my colleagues who helped uh, me quite a lot with this project and contributed quite a lot. And I also would like to acknowledge the support of my colleagues in the Nederlandse Aardolie Maatschappij. And on top of that, I would like to thank you for your attention.